Theme music, please. Aloha, everybody. Welcome to On Hawaiian Time. I'm Mick Kelber. I'm Bruce Omari. And you are... On On Hawaiian Hawaiian Time. Time. Okay, folks, so on Hawaiian time today, we have a very special person in the hot seat. My wife, my best friend, my bodyguard, and Lindsay Calber. Welcome. Someone's got to do it. (laughs) It's a dirty job, isn't it? All right, so we're going to talk about a little bit about Annie's life and even more about Annie's art. But before we get to Anne's exclusive interview, we'd like to go around the Zoom. Bruce, what have you been doing lately? (laughs) <laughs> well, I've been uh, on Netflix. I've been streaming this uh, series called The Playbook. It's um, a series about coaches mm-hmm. and their philosophies and everything. It's been really interesting. A lot of their philosophies are how they, it's like their rules for life, you know? Like one episode was about Doc Rivers, a uh, basketball coach, right? And um, he. Um, led them, he led the Boston Celtics to uh, the NBA championship. And um, uh, really cool about how he talked about being able to bring these superstars together and, you know, have them be able to play uh, as a team rather than, um, you know, as individuals. And uh, it took a commitment from everybody and, that was kind of unique because not any coach can do that, you know? And, uh, yeah, so his story was pretty cool. It's actually pretty remarkable how, how different coaches have different styles, yeah, isn't sure it? sure do. And uh, another one was this guy, Jose Marino. Marino. Yeah. And, man, the guy comes across as super arrogant. Maybe I shouldn't have said that since he's going to be listening. But (laughs) (laughs) no, but his, yeah. Okay. Sorry. So, Tim, what have you been up to? (laughs) Next. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, you're out. (laughs) You're out, bro. (laughs) Oh, what have I been up to? Man, I wish there was more exciting news. You know, with COVID, we're still sort of on lockdown. We've been. Andrew and I have gone to Hapuna Beach uh, a couple times in the past week and a half. So that's been nice. The beaches were closed, but now they're open again, technically. Um, I don't know. I had breakfast with you one morning, Mick, after we did a, a prank on you. Uh, <laughs> breakfast, um, that's big. That was awesome. <laughs> pranked you with the parking ticket. That was fun. Yeah, they were real nice <laughs> to me. I just been editing away on podcasts and it's- other projects, just, you know. Living life. Cool. And Annie? So um, last week I was uh, painting uh, a flying carp. I do um, uh, carp flags and um, I was able to paint one of those. It's a special gift for a family member. So I'm really excited. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't say anything yet. Well, you can say it now. She wouldn't even hear this. That was long <laughs> There gone. you go. Anyway. And <laughs> um, that and making jam, you know, guava jam. Got some uh, frozen uh, jibota kaba that I pulled out. And so I'm making some of that. And um, and making masks. Yes. I got an order for uh, for some people in California that wanted oh, masks. Cool. So. Jamming. And taking Still. care of your husband. Chairman, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. All right. I've been, um, gosh, I've, I've kind of had a hard time here lately. I have an acre of property here that I mow and try to take care of as much as I can. And my riding mower broke. The deck finally gave up the ghost. Oh, and I have to get a new deck. And so now I'm using my push mower. Not my push mower. It's got self-propelled, but still, it's about four times as much work. It takes about four times as long and is about 10 times harder on my body. And um, it's tough, but hopefully the deck, new deck will show up soon and we'll be back back on board. And he gets $5 more for his, nice. his allowance. <laughs> That's right. So. That's right. <laughs> See how well she treats me? <laughs> so speaking of treating me well, uh, let's talk about your art, Andy. Let's okay. go. Let's go, let's get okay. in the way back machine, okay? okay? And let's go way, way back to the early sixties. Mm. And what do you remember as your first art project? 
Well, there was a lot of finger painting, but the <laughs> one that really stands out was um, I had a piece my mother kept in our bathroom forever, and it was a blue replica sculpted in clay of Fred Flintstone on his dinosaur. <laughs> Awesome. Boy, it doesn't get yeah. much better than awesome. that, does it, and folks? And it was appropriate that it was in the bathroom on the <laughs> <laughs> on the shelf in the bathroom. <laughs> That's great. So that, that was that was the beginning of a long and storied me. art career. Absolutely. Right. What happened after you did that brilliant part? Did that, did that go in the Smithsonian <laughs> eventually, or no? no? They wouldn't take it. Oh, all right. So, so what was next? So. Um, you know, art was always a big part of my life. My mother was an was an artist uh, in her own right. She was majored in art history, um, and so there always were projects going on. I remember making um, mosaic uh, tile uh, tabletops with her. She even made a, a surfboard with my brother. When I was real little, I remember that, gosh, the smell of resin that filled the entire house. But my mom always had art projects going and was always uh, in tune to um, my need or my attention drawn to art. Um, she, um, she was a, um, a teacher uh, assistant at the Honolulu Academy of Art. Interestingly... Annie and I have been together. This is our 20th year of marriage this year. We're working on it. God's working on it. We're not doing it. And um, we've been together longer than that. We've been together about 24 years. I never knew Annie's mom was into art. You know, I, she did needlepoint, but lots of people do needlepoint that aren't into art, you know. I knew she was into the academy, but um, wow, you learn something every day. So, you know, you were raised where and... Went to school where? So, born and raised in Hawaii. I'm third generation. My mother was raised here. My grandmother was raised here. And um, uh, mostly in Kailua. And then high school years, junior high, high school years in uh, Nu'uanu on Oahu. So, um, I, I attended a lot of courses and a lot of activities at the Honolulu Art Academy. And um, just loved it. I always felt like museums were my church. Um, and, um, always loved that, but, uh, you know, my mom always made it, um, known and made priorities for art to be a big part of my life. I mean, she taught me at a young age how to sew and, um, my great grandmother had been a seamstress. She had a, um, like a, um, a dress shop in downtown Honolulu and then my grandmother was a seamstress. She could make anything. And my mother also. So when I learned to sew at like six or seven, um, it was, um, it came pretty naturally. I had a lot of good examples around me. And even to the fact where um, there was a sewing shop uh, that gave classes during the summer and you had to be nine to take a class. And at seven, my mother took me in. And um, the lady said, I, I can't take her. She's only seven. And my mom says, but she can sew. She can sew. So this lady gave me these examples of, of that I needed to sew. And I did it up. And she was impressed. And I got in the class at cool. seven. <laughs> so, A child prodigy. <laughs> yeah, underage sewing. sewing. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Good news is you can't get arrested for that, I don't really, think. Not yet. <laughs> so, but it was... Um, uh, art was always a real big part of my life, keeping busy. My mom is like that. She always had something going. How'd you do in school? Were you a student? I was pretty good at math. Reading was really hard. School was hard. I was um, very, very fortunate to go to um, Hawaii School for Girls, which is in uh, on Oahu. It's in the old Dillingham estate. It's now called La Pietra. Uh. And it was all girls. And it was great in that they really... Um, put together the curriculum to suit you. You weren't a square peg shoved into a round, round hole. And, you know, it was uh, good in that I had to take the basic courses, but that I was given three art courses um, or uh, art assistant in some cases. Um, so they really directed the, my process and my, my whole learning uh, through 
what I needed, not what they felt I needed. So it was really great. It was really made a difference. So you graduated high school and went to college? I did. I went to, I really wanted to go to California College of Arts and Crafts, but my grades weren't even close to it. Um, So I went to uh, Hawaii Loa College. Uh, It's over on the slopes of the Ko'olau's. Um, right at the intersection before you turn to uh, Kaneohe or go into Kailua. And I was there for a year. I was interested in preschool education, but the art courses there were were great. There was a gentleman who's taught drawing that still, I I still hear his voice. I still use some of his techniques when I when I go to go to work. And that was really great. So I was there for a year. And then the Big Island was calling me. I loved the Big Island. And so it was, I'll date myself here, summer of 1976, August, I moved to uh, Hilo and started going to University of Hawaii at Hilo. And you really entered the art world shortly thereafter when you met a woman, right? That did stained glass? Yeah. So I, uh, I heard about someone, uh, a woman opening up a stained glass shop in Keao. I also knew through um, my family that I have in Hilo that um, there was a mutual friend that opened a pottery shop. And it was in a art hui, an art uh, uh, incubator type of setup, in an old bil- uh, sugarcane building in Keao. And it was called the Sugar Mill. And it was a great little complex. It had a stained glass uh, studio. It had um, a jeweler. There were great furniture makers. And then in the back, uh, Randy, who ended up being my first husband. Hello. Yeah. um, Was a potter. And he had a production pottery studio in the back. So I walked in. I, I knew the university could give me some of the basics. But in my mind, I was set on the fact that I... No one was going to show me at the university how to sell my work. I was already, I had a little uh, studio apartment up at uh, top of Waikeauka. And I had already turned my kitchen into a full batik uh, studio. So um, I was doing batik fabric. I was selling um, uh, pillows at at fairs. There were two great fairs uh, in Hilo every year. And they were put on by the uh, university group called uh, uh, Puna Young Farmers. And uh, it was the Mother Earth Fair that was the weekend before Mother's Day. And that was at the community college. And then there was the Christmas Fair that was up at the UH Hilo. And those, I would set up there and sell my wares and and, uh, always drawn to that process. But I knew that I had kind of, you know, gone through all the courses I could at Hilo. I was not close to graduating. Um, And I decided to go in. I walked in. Beverly Jackson was the woman who owned the stained glass studio. And I asked her if I could uh, be an apprentice. And she said yes. And uh, I worked a couple days uh, alone in the studio selling art supplies. And she gave me a table and she taught me how to do stained glass. So I did stained glass for about five years. Yeah. And this is about the time that you and Randy got married? Yeah. And During, you lived where? We uh, we got married, and shortly before then, we moved up to Mountain View, bought a piece of land. I think it was like $5,000 for an acre. And um, it was in Fern Acres, and we uh, bulldozed it and built a house and later on put um, his studio. We moved his studio from KL up onto the property. Off-grid. Off-grid, Yep generator uh, we ended up finally getting power we lived for a while you know with e- not even indoor plumbing and uh you know it really makes you appreciate life and what there has but we were young you know we were young but then you you kind of moved your business to hilo exactly we knew that one of us had to take the the um business end of it and so it was definitely me uh, randy is a uh made functional pottery uh, and just beautiful pottery. Made great pottery. You know what? I'm not into pottery, but I loved Randy's stuff. It was really great. Yeah. It is really great. And uh, it, it sold really well. And so um, we went into Hilo. We opened up a small shop uh, called the Potter's Gallery in the Mamo Mart at the top of Mamo Street. And then we ended up uh, getting a... Um, location on the corner of Wainui Nui and Keave and opened up the Potter's Gallery there and started taking more artists in. We became uh, part of a collective group of uh, stores there called the Keave Collection. And we actually started, um, we did a black and white exhibit in our gallery 
uh, and started Black and White Night. Very cool. There. Um, yeah. yeah, that part of Keave was a real hot spot back in Hilo. Remember that, Bruce? Or were you in yep, Oahu I then? I was working on Oahu, so I missed all that action. Well, <laughs> yeah, Keave Street was really a happening yeah. place in Hilo, and they were right in the middle of it. First Friday, like they have, we would uh, we would have um, openings. We would do exhibits, and we would have um, m- live music. We could serve wine and and nice. uh, uh, poopoos, and it was a place to be. It was really really fun. But what about that day in 1985 when the tsunami came? You mean when that news <laughs> reporter showed up? Oh, who was that? Well, that was you, honey. <laughs> that was me. And I, inter- I interviewed her. Randy was in the background pounding nails in the door and glaring at me. And, you know, I was like, I'm just trying to get information out of her, you know. I still have that interview. We should put that interview roll, up. Roll the clip. Jim. Yeah, you'll, Go you'll ahead, love Mick, that. Say it. Roll the clip, Tim. <laughs> worried about the tsunami? Sure, sure. Uh, we've packed up all our merchandise and we're uh, put it up for safe uh, keeping for a while. Uh-huh. And you're boarding up your doors? Yes, we're uh, hoping to seal off the bottom so if water gets up, it's high, it won't come in, rushing in. Uh Have you been through anything like this before? No, growing up in Hawaii, I've heard a lot of them, but we've never come this close. Uh Are you you concerned? Sure. Mm, Nervous. Nervous. Okay, thanks a lot. Can you tell me your name? Anne, Anne Morehouse. Uh Uh-huh, and your position here? Um, I'm an owner. My husband and I own the gallery, the Potter's Gallery. She didn't know that was coming. <laughs> really? So, so, but, but the, Potter, the Potter's Gallery was quite the place. Really was. I mean, and I loved um, showing and selling uh, local artists, Big Island artists. And we were doing really well. I mean, at the time on the Big Island, the economy was booming. And a lot of it was cash business from uh, Pakalolo. <laughs> I mean, there was a AKA not... Marijuana. Yeah. Um, it <laughs> It was uh, uh, not uncommon to have someone come in and drop $2,000 cash on the counter and walk out with a beautiful koa table oh, or a, a very large canvas of art. Um, it was booming. And then we had a lot of um, the ship people coming in. And then we, would, we shipped, uh, mailed out um, work all over. So it was great, and I really loved it. There are the, there's the artist that comes in who's very professional, has it all together, and then there's the artist who has this incredible work but is lacking in presentation and labels and, and how to present. And it was just like, bring your stuff in. Just give it to me. I'll put it together. I mean, one thing I, I love to mention is the fact that uh, um, – uh, G. Brad Lewis came in and said, hey, uh, you know, I've got these pictures of the lava. What do you think about me? You know, you, would you be interested in selling them? And I couldn't get them from him fast um, enough, you know. Yeah, yeah. Became very famous, exactly. the guy. Exactly. Um, and that was about the time that you had a little addition to the family, right? Yeah, we had my son, Drew, um, who... Um, You know, pretty much from the time I conceived, you know, everybody watched as, you know, he came into the world. And then a couple months after I had him, we I would take him to work with me, pop him on the table in a little seat there. And he had a bassinet in the back. So, yeah. But he didn't gravitate toward art, did he? No, I mean, he always had it in his life, you know, Um whether it was playing in clay or doing, you know, being uh, surrounded by it. But, you know, he was a real, real physical kid. He, yeah. he was, he's a soccer kid. Yeah, ocean kid. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Fishing, ocean, and all of that. And he's now. Yep, he's now a paramedic and, uh, and absolutely loves it. Wants to come home, but for the time being, he's in Santa Barbara. Yep. yep. Good yeah. for him, has a girlfriend. And what about a woman called Karen Halverson? Hmm. Nottingham. Exactly. Albertson. She was an uh, uh, incredible artist that we were able to um, have here on the Big Island. Karen moved here with her first husband and uh, her son and had another son. And I fell in love with her. Um, her work was whimsical. She was just a very strong artist and she was so much fun. And we became dear, dear friends. And I actually was a um, artist assistant for her. There was a point where mm, life kind of unfolded and um, Randy and I broke up. And with that, 
the gallery closed and I started working independently. I worked at the picture frame shop and I worked for her as an artist assistant. So I would go in, pull paper for her, help her uh, in her process. She did, you know, internationally known work that was shipped all over and for exhibits and things like that. And Karen had a very famous father, didn't she? Yeah, she did. Walt. Walt Nottingham, he was an incredible fiber artist, uh, recognized in the Smithsonian and just an absolutely incredible man. So yeah. it was a great gift to have that, you know, international and nationally known art uh, locally. Okay, so what was next? So, you know, I always, as far as art went, always had something going. And one thing that I really enjoyed doing was uh, what I called rewine vases. And I would take... Um, large wine bottles and cut the the bottleneck off and I would etch them and sell them. Uh, so it always seemed to be something. I always wanted to do that or I would do, you know, jewelry. There were earrings that I would sell and, and uh, things like that. I presently uh, work in uh, indigo, indigo dyeing and a specific technique called shibori, which is a Japanese style of... Um, uh, it, from stitch work uh, to blocking and pressing, what you actually do is you you tighten up areas within the fabric that blocks the dye from coming. Uh, and so you've got with indigo, uh, bl the blue of indigo, and then the white of wherever you've put your patterns. And I love it. Um, I first saw it in some books that I saw um, in a collection owned by uh, a woman I was uh, assisting, um, Patricia Salmon, uh, a great woman and a great supporter of the arts in uh, Hilo. She has an incredible Japanese artwork collection that uh, she's been working to sell to national and international museums. And she brought me on to help her assist this. And in her collection of just books, I found these books on Shibori and indigo and just fell in love with it. And from there, you know, as often you dive into the internet and see what pops up. And it really caught my eye. I did a workshop, uh, a real just uh, kind of fun workshop. It wasn't a real artsy type of thing. And I fell in love with it and immediately started getting all these different supplies and fabrics and stuff. So that's been my... Um, my passion for a while. Um, and I've done that in groups. Uh, it's been fun to do. I did a family event. Uh, a, my nephew's uh, uh, wife was pregnant. And so all the family got together and we dyed onesies, you know, things like that. But it's instant gratification in the process. And um, it's people love it. Um, I tend to, I guess, get into my own space and my own element to where I'm getting in this flow, you know, and, and sometimes that's hard when with so many people involved in an element, you know, it's like a dye bath uh, to me, an indigo dye that is a living element. And so you have to treat it carefully to put in and out things and all of a sudden it can turn into a free for all. So. You know, and that, that is this is a good time maybe to talk about what you were telling me yesterday about how, you don't plan the things that yeah. you do and sure. how they happen for you. Sure. You know, it's a, uh, art is a, a, at least for me, is a process of letting go. If I try to control what I'm going to make, uh, it doesn't come out as well as when I let whatever I'm working on speak to me. Um, and I see that a lot. Like I've been hand painting carps. Uh, that I turn into, um, you know, uh, wind, wind flags, wind... Flying fish. <laughs> flying fish. And, um, you know, when I start to make them, I don't draw everything out. I, it comes to me where a fin should go, where the scales should go, the design of the scales, how the tail should go. I mean, I really feel like it speaks to me. I'm just the, the way of bringing it out, bringing it to life, you know, and, and I really appreciate that. It makes it so much fun. You know, I see the frustration of being an artist when we try to control, when we try to make it look a specific thing rather than having it. Kind of like a metaphor yeah. for life, isn't it? Got it. Absolutely. I've heard that same thing said might, from writers and things too, and other types of creatives. I personally 
I struggle with that. I, I want to have a tight grip on things, but I think it's a good lesson to let things sort of unfold. Yeah. Even in, even in our business, as um, non-artistic as it is in a lot of ways, there is a certain amount of letting go that you have to do, to, I think, to make things, so, to allow things to happen. And, you know, that, as you folks can tell, I think this is Annie's passion. It is. It is. And, and to be able to do it, it's like a dream come true to make it, uh, to be able to do my art and actually uh, bring finances in to, to make money from it. You know, to me, my artwork is uh, the most exciting part other than living with you <laughs> uh, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, of my life. And it's like um, I have that voice in my head that says you can't do your art until you've got everything else done, you know. And to make art a priority for me is um, really been freeing. And, and I have to say, and I credit um, Nick's mom, Betty, um, she has always been a great supporter of my work and sitting down at her great table in the kitchen where, where lots of great ideas are formed and stuff. She said, you should really do this. You should, she wanted me to open up a shop, you know, and, and you should do this. You should, you know, make this available to everybody. And it was just such a gift that she gave me by, by talking about that to say, wow, you know, maybe I could, you know. Uh, it's interesting. I can sell everybody else's work, but sometimes it's not as easy to sell mine or I'm the first one to say, but this is a flaw or this is, you know. And it, of course, with artwork, someone will come in and want that, see that flaw and say, can you make this again, you know? So <laughs> it's, it's a process, but I really do credit uh, Betty with really um, her enthusiasm and her love and support of saying, you know, you should do this. You're great at it. It's funny how you hear something like that from a particular person and all of a sudden something yeah. clicks, you know? Yeah. And by the way, we, Annie and I are in the process of developing a or designing a working studio for her in our second carport. We're going to take at least half, if not more, of the carport and make a, a real studio. Because at the moment, um, a lot of the artwork <laughs> is done here on the lanai or in the living room or various other places on the property. So it'd be nice to kind of consolidate that and have art over there and have our life over here. Nice. So, but Very um, cool. So I want to jump back just a little bit here for okay. a minute because we kind of skipped um, an important event. When I came, when I first saw Annie at the gallery when I was a newsman shooting the tsunami in, I think it was 1985, um, I was not there to break up her marriage. You can't blame that one on me. That was that was not me. But years after that, um, not a lot of years, but a few years after that, we got together, and um, that's an art form in itself. That is a, <laughs> the art form was that we did it successfully somehow, or we had a little bit of help. But um, do you remember how that came about? Yes. How? <laughs> Remind me. <laughs> well, uh, there there are two elements. When we started dating, yeah, okay, um, uh, sure. I was. Uh, I guess I should tell the first part. <laughs> I asked a friend of ours at the soccer field. I was playing McCooley soccer at that time, and that's like uh, older men and, and women, older men and younger women, because it was better <laughs> that way. Uh, we played soccer down at Bayfront. Um, I came down to pick up my son, my, my uh, first husband, my <laughs> Drew's dad, was playing soccer. And, he, and I came down to the field to pick him up and uh, saw you for the first time in a long time. I thought you played a, that's one season in Mahalia. Oh, after we got anyway, together. I asked a friend of mine if she had Annie's number because I knew Annie, but I wasn't. And at the time, I was separated and divorcing and all that, so... Um, I called her up, we talked, and we, we went out and had, had a very, uh, very propitious first date. Mm. Um, yeah, tell them what happened, Danny. We, went, we met at a Thai restaurant down across the catty corner from um, Just Cruising Coffee. And what happened? You were waiting for me to show up. Waiting for me to show up, and I look across in the parking lot right there, and there are these two cars screeching through the parking lot. And I'm watching, and at one point, one car pins the other one in, gets out and starts bashing Whoa. in the windows oh, of this car with a baseball bat. And my first thought was, is this an <laughs> omen? <laughs> she knew right from then this marriage was going to be a big is, hit. 
Is this Literally. a sign that I need to see? <laughs> <laughs> wow. No, uh, but we hit it off. We hit it off. We started dating, and, and um, I asked Andy to work for me, and it took me a while to pry her away from her previous job because she's loyal and dedicated, and she wouldn't leave for a while. But Andy finally came to work for me in my office doing accounting work, and um, and she fell wait, for me. Wait. You know, I chased her until she wait, caught wait, me. Wait, wait. I want to know which car what, what, what? were you in, Mick? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, those were my minions that I sent around to impress my girlfriend, you know? Yeah, it was an ex-girlfriend. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but anyway, those were the beginnings of us getting together. And then I took her to Costco, and that's where she fell in love. That's where we fell in love, because we both enjoyed shopping It's a very romantic Costco. place. I've never had... <laughs> Yeah, I know, exactly. Right? It says a I lot know, about right? our relationship. You guys keep up the tradition you know? too, right? Yeah. <laughs> There's things to be the said. Anniversaries at Costco, true. the whole, the whole bit. You bet. Everything. You bet. Exactly. Well, that's and that's all we'll t- say about that. So, and question. Um, so you've dabbled in all these different forms of art or creating art. Is there one that um, you know you truly love? And or is your first love or your, you know, the thing that can consume you or is it just a journey that you're on, um, you know, to experience different methods of creating? Yeah, something something catches my eye and maybe it's that figuring it out, Mm. you know, and watching it grow. I mean, like just recently I saw a cyanotype printing. Uh the blue and white printing. Mm -hmm. And it really caught me. Um, And there's some uh, artists on the Big Island that are incredible. I mean, I'm hoping COVID gets over soon because I really want to connect with these people. But I start looking into it. And then it's the unfolding and how far can I go? Mm -hmm. And um, it it is, I I do tend to, maybe it's a a short attention span, but I do jump Mm -hmm. around, you know, I do fill with one and then I kind of take a break. I, I like, I haven't done a, a vat of indigo uh, for about seven months um, just because with indigo, it's like having um, a child. You take care of it. You feed it regularly. You take care of it and can have to control mm. it. So it's one of those things that once you get it going, you got to stay with it and take care of it. I can't just put it away like your art supplies, uh-huh. but you know, it's the passion. It's like, um, you know, and then I'm, I'm back at, you know, doing my carp now, my, my flying fish. And it is, you know, that goes back to, um, I tell the story of how jealous I was when it was boys day and the Japanese uh, families would put the, 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 for every man, every Uh male, there would put a fish out. And I love those. And I was so upset because they were for boys <laughs> and I was a girl, you uh-huh. know? So it's like, uh, I was bound and determined. I, I always loved them. And, um, so I, I want to, I wanted to keep that going and, and immediately started to do that. I mean, I, I also it kind of started after I started doing prayer flags. Mm-hmm. Um, that was fun. And it was, um, I started doing them for events, which was really neat. At one point, the YWCA with their um, um, domestic violence program, they had me come on Domestic Violence Day and set up for all the families to come and they could paint. I I cut these squares of fabric and they could all come and paint. And so it was a wonderful example of sharing what intention, as a prayer flag, what intention do you want to paint to put out to the world? And so there were from little kids to adults to, and it was just so rewarding, not just the painting, but the idea of what intention do you want to blow in the uh. wind to take forth and, and blow out there, you know? And it was wonderful. We hung them all around the YWCA in downtown awesome. Hilo. And I think after that, they they found homes, but... You know, it's art is so incredible in that bringing it, like you said, to others or for people to see something handmade, Mm. you know, and and know that you put that work into Mm. it. Awesome. And can I ask you a question? Um, So you've seen 
what it's like in terms of selling art from a, a brick and mortar, a gallery. And now you were mentioning online has become the way to, to sell and buy art. Are there advantages to the online world in like, like platforms like Etsy, for example, is this a, sure. is this a positive, uh, is this progress in the art world or, you know, how do you see that? You know, for the artist that wants to stay in their studio and work, um, it's the online sales is incredible. I mean, what I would really love to have at, at some point, if we did have tourists back here and did have um, the traffic, you know, that's your biggest thing, is to be able to have a, a working studio that has a shop to it that's open. But with a brick and mortar, and, and Bruce can tell you this, when your overhead is rent, utilities, employees, that's a big, big chunk to have to put out every, every month. But if you can, if you're a working artist, you know, the more I can be in my studio and take, you know, I um, was doing tie dye for a while and um, I was selling it like crazy on Etsy. Now at the time, Etsy was just known as handmade. Right now, um, you can sell anything on Etsy. Um uh, a lot of fabricated stuff. There aren't a lot of original artists, but when it was just artist based, I, I was, I, you know, I would take pictures of everything. You have your listings all ready to go in the morning, put them up. You work all day. You put your orders together. It, it's, it's all done so well that you actually print out your postage. You put it straight on your packages and you drop them in the mail. I mean, it was so easy and so fast. And I had some great customers and you also do your special orders too. So, you know, that's your biggest headache is your overhead costs for rent, employees and and utilities it, that's a big one to where when we had our gallery it was a 60 40 split the gallery took uh 40 percent of a sale and an artist got 60 so that's a that's a big chunk in addition to all this this she's talking about she's making jam for people she's ma selling things for our granddaughter she's working with the uh, leilani board with Leilani Estates Board. I mean, you talk about an active person, a community person. Mm -hmm. Here she is right mm -hmm. here, you know. I don't do that. I mean, sorry, I don't. I'm a bad person. But, you know, <laughs> Annie makes up for me, thankfully. So, you know, my hat's <laughs> off to her for that. You know, I, I tease her about it because it's like, oh, yeah, well, that's what you need. One more project, you know. Add one more thing to the list. But, hey, you know, good for her. You know, good for us. It's, it's a wonderful thing. So, Well, let me comment what? on oh, that. Oh, okay, comment on that. So, <laughs> uh, in my family, my father and my mother also were always community-oriented. You know, they used to say that as kids, we're probably conceived in a committee. You know, my father <laughs> was on the, the blood uh -oh. bank, you know. <laughs> The, the blood bank, he was always involved in the community, a rotary, you name it. And so I really appreciate that my parents gave that to all of us kids. Your community is as strong as you are. And uh, seeing those efforts when working for Downtown Improvement Association, you know, uh, at the time the Improvement, Downtown Improvement Association started because there was a mall, the Prince Cujillo Mall was coming and it was going to, you know, downtown Hilo was going to melt away into nothing. But it was the strength of the community coming together and promoting events and, and elements that a mall can't do, you know. But um, definitely, I, I appreciate that, you know, if everyone can give a little in a community, the community benefits. And so that's... I, I really appreciate that my parents gave us that uh, and that, you know, you don't just complain about something. What is it that you can do to help and promote and be part of the solution? And Leilani exactly. appreciates all that effort, too. I mean, you do a great job here. Thanks. Really great job. Thanks, sweetie. Okay, so now it's time for the takeaway. So I'm going to let you guys go first. I guess, uh, Tim, why don't you give it a shot first? What's your takeaway about all this stuff that Annie does? The beautiful, beautiful stuff. You know, for me, like what I got out of this conversation and, and what I've seen from, from Anne's process is, you know, you shouldn't be afraid to, to put yourself out there. And I think as an artist, that's probably scary. And it's scary for a lot of people, but as an artist, like it's such a personal thing, your artwork 
And I think it's easy for, for people to be like, oh man, I don't want to put myself out there because people might not like it or it might not be good enough. But I think if you do just, you know, take that chance, put yourself out there and you know, don't worry about what people think because it's, it's your mm-hmm. thing. And if other people benefit from it or, or they get something out of it, that's great. That's a bonus. But if you can just get it out there, um, I think it's just, if you don't, if you don't put it out there, you'll never know. And I think don't be afraid to fail, you know, because people fail all the time and you, you're never going to succeed or get anything out of life if you don't take those chances. I think that's, that's how you, that's how you learn by failing, mm-hmm. right, cool. Andy? Yeah, exactly. And not everybody's yeah. taste is, is yours. I mean, I remember having a gallery and uh, in the gallery, I'd have people come in and go, I just don't really like that painting. I just, and it's like, but it gotcha. It got something out of you, you know, whether it's good or bad or whatever, it connected you. You know, so anyway, thanks. What do you got, B? Yeah, I agree with Tim, you know, his uh, take on things um, and your journey through um, the creative process, no matter what the, the um, I, I don't know what you call it, the, the means to create or the means of creating. Um, I, I, I think that journey is is awesome. You know, I, I've seen um, a number of different um, things. I, I don't know if you call them genres or, or what, but you know, the different um, products you've created or art forms. And, you know, each one is so unique and it's awesome, beautiful. And, uh, you know, oh, yeah, I got to say that your guava jam <laughs> rocks. <laughs> <laughs> it does. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, you know, I appreciate um, your effort in uh, just chasing after. Uh, maybe it's not even chasing. It's that desire to uh, dabble in these different art forms because uh, each one um, is so unique and, uh, uh, brings about a different, you know, reaction, I think from everybody. Uh, I know within myself, I think each different art form is, uh, um, it evokes or brings about a different, um, uh, um, I don't know what I'm trying to say. It brings about a different sense of appreciation, you know? So I, I love it and just continue. And um, thanks. Yeah, I look forward to seeing your journey as this artist. Cool. And uh, yeah, it's awesome. And I also got to say that, you know, I totally agree with uh, you guys' um, statement about um, being part of the solution and not, not just complaining about things because as a business owner here in Hilo, um, you know, that's the hardest thing for anybody to appreciate without actually being in our shoes as a business owner. I mean, you know, there are so many things people complain about until you get involved, uh, you know, whether it's, as a business owner or uh, being part of the board of uh, like the downtown improvement association. So easy for, you know, these, these businesses that, that um, benefit from the downtown improvement associations efforts, but they don't get involved. So they don't know all the obstacles the organization is faced with. And man, it, it's, it's a tough thing, you know? And, uh, we deal with it on a daily basis. And uh, so I appreciate your involvement, your past involvement with DIA and um, uh, also with the Leilani board. Uh, I can imagine what that's like. You can't imagine what that's <laughs> <Really>? like. <laughs> you don't want to yeah, imagine what that's but, like. Yeah, but you know, it's, it's through people that get involved like you do that makes things better for everybody, mm. so. Uh, really yeah, appreciate. We love you. Oh, and thanks, Bruce. <laughs> she Absolutely. makes things better for me. I know that. Really. Thanks. <laughs> what do you think of the? So t- you know, the my takeaway take on on Annie is um, um, 
I, I agree with you that, you know, you need to put yourself out there. What, what makes it a little different from what Tim and I do, doing video and audio and stuff, and what, what Annie does is there's a little bit more nuts and bolts involved in what we do. It's, it's a, a bit less of a creative process, but there can be creativity in it. In putting things together in a video, in a video form, there are a million different ways to do that. And, you know, you can turn the camera on and run it for an hour and you have an hour show. Or you can shoot it for five years and put it together and have an hour show. You know, there's a million different ways to do it. And there's a, of the million different people that are doing it. But part of my process, like Annie, is when I get into the times where I'm, where I'm actually trying to be creative with something and not just trying to, to show this and that and the other thing, when I'm trying to make something that's more than just what it seems to be, it's really, it's really important for me to take a back seat, to you know, do the process and, and know that the process is going to uh, create itself, really. Hmm. You know, that, that through a higher power or the universe or you know, whatever you want to call it, that there's an energy that comes through that helps you do that. And I, I've, you know, I've done that most of my life in, in doing creative type television or what I hope is creative type television. But, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it, it takes letting go. It takes letting it happen. It takes putting one foot in front of the other one and being synergistic about it and having the, the wherewithal to say, this is going to work. Something's going to happen. You know, and, and when I do it, sometimes it doesn't happen and I start over again. But eventually the pieces fall into place. You know, and, and, and put it, you know, putting the shows, the overflights together that Bruce and I did every day, it, that was, man, it was, it was fast. It was quick. It was too fast and too quick, but they fell together. <laughs> they were, they were, you know, they came together. It was pretty amazing to me how that happened. So, cause it, a lot of that was out of my hands. I'll tell you that. So that's what I get out of it. I, th I think that's a, an awesome segue because uh, your partner in crime shooting photos next to you up in the helicopter over the volcano wasn't always Bruce. Before you met Bruce, Anne was next yep. to you shooting some show photos. Is that, is that a good segue for <laughs> yeah, really. the lava pit? Yeah, yeah, the lava pit. I mean, we used to, partners in crime, we used to hike out, you know, before dawn, out to the flows, and that was absolutely incredible. Um, but yeah, shooting in the in the helicopters was great. I ended up getting kind of sick on the helicopters and stopped doing it, you know. Um, but um, Tell them no, what we I did. did. So one of uh, the lava pics that I have to share. This is the fissure, the Nepal fissure eruption. It happened in what was the date? Uh, Two thousand eleven, I believe, early May. A yep. And um, we heard that, um, that there was an eruption happening, and we called Cal, and Cal made arrangements to fly in, gosh, right about dawn. I think as soon as they got light in Kona, they flew over, and um, he took us out, and it was incredible. So this was about 7 a.m., and... Pu Puo had collapsed, and Hale Ma'o Ma'o had also collapsed. And all that lava showed up in Nepal, which was about a mile or two miles um, between Pu'uo and Hale Ma'umau. And it erupted in a, a line of fissures about a mile long. It was outstanding. Absolutely outstanding. Awesome. Yeah. What are we looking at here? This is um, a shot of the, uh, uh, from uh, Paradise Helicopters um, second, we had two, um, helicopters up there uh, in fact the gentleman who's flying this helicopter <laughs> it was his first day on the job he had just moved here wow. and uh he had no idea what was uh, happening and i it brought everybody such joy to think you know that this was his first day on the job and at this at, at the same time thinking it's never going to be the same for him <laughs> he's yeah. never going to get a day like this again and he never saw anything that that big again so, what a great day for him, though. Crazy. And I think Ikaika was in that. Uh, it was, uh, or no, no, was it? I don't know. I can't remember. It it might have been. I don't know. We can try to zoom in on this photo later. And, and see if we see I don't him. Know, we don't really have the CSI <laughs> optic technology, but. So, yeah, I, that was, that was. You know, it's amazing to me looking at. 
looking at this photo, not only the line of fissures, but this chasm that all the lava is yes. pouring into. Oh, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Pouring it's into incredible. that crack. That was a big crack, too. So when it poured into that crack, did it just disappear, yep. Yep. or did you see it nope. kind of... Gone. You can see on the left-hand side there where it's going down another crack, but that was much smaller. But the crack on the right side there, the big one, it just dumped into that hole and it, you didn't see it down further and you never saw it come up again. It was again, like a so. waterfall when you could actually yeah. get a shot in. It was crazy. That was pretty low. Oh, the bullet of it. Is this from the ground? No, no, no they're all no. from Chopper. All from, we were in the Bell 407. Cal, with Cal. Cal got us pretty low. In fact, at one point we were uh, too close to some USGS and we were told that we were too close to yeah, the we USGS. Got in trouble. <laughs> Wait, how were you told? I want to hear well, this story. Well, uh, David Okita was in another helicopter and he said, uh, hey, did you hear what the scientist said? Because the scientist called up to us too and said, said you're too close to us. And I, um, we didn't see them at first. I don't know if Cal did. I don't think he did. But when then I finally spotted them and then David said, you guys are, you're buzzing the scientists and and Cal said, uh, yeah, sorry, and we backed, up, backed off, but we didn't, we didn't see him down there. And I guess one of the scientists was frightened and the other one was not, so, you know. This whatever. shot is one of my favorite. The, sh the, the line of the fissure and then right behind it, that's Pu'o oh, right up here. And there was down right before mm. Pu'o, oh, there was a little spatter cone there too that was actually quite we, pretty. Uh, yeah. Is that what we can see there in the yeah. distance? Yes. Well, that was just a little break out there. Yeah. But this went on for, I don't know, three days, four days, something like that. But they closed the airspace off. So you could get up there the first day, and that was it. After that, it was shut down. I got hired by ABC to go up there, and we could hardly even get to a place where we could see it. It was ridiculous. And it, uh, it was three-mile radius or something like that. You know, it was a, a joke. Oh, that sounds familiar. It was really a joke. <laughs> no, but it was worse than that. I mean, where yeah. we were, you could barely, barely even see it at all. Hmm. And it was huge. So beautiful. Crazy. And then after this stopped, these, these after this stopped, all the lava came back to Pu'u'u'u. It came back to Hale Mau Mau. Crazy. But not the so last time. So at the time, time, Mick, you were shooting video of this and you were shooting, shooting the still right. photos. Were you guys working um, for a wire service or anything? No. Or were you putting this out? For no, we just sold it to whoever wanted to buy it. You know, Annie, I don't know who Annie. So, no, I, I, I don't think, I think I've sold to Honolulu Star Bulletin, but, uh, you know, I, I feel for Bruce. Selling to print is extremely hard. You know, my, my favorite story is, is. when the last houses on, <clears throat> in Royal Gardens were um, being taken, I shot some, and Mick says, call, call, you know, uh, New York Times, see if they, so I got up, you know, middle of the night and called uh, the New York Times and the guy goes, well, he goes, uh, do you have any shots of burning buildings? No, no building. I said, but I've got a picture of a <laughs> naked guy in his backyard. And he goes, well, if it's Brad Pitt, we'll take it, you know? Oh my God. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what it is. That's uh, it's a fickle business. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I couldn't Photoshop Brad Pitt enough. And so... <laughs> Well, plus the guy was going like this, you know, so giving them the we're number one sign, so it wasn't going to happen. <laughs> Wait, there was a naked guy in his backyard yeah. flipping yeah. the bird yeah. off to you as you flew yeah. over. Yeah, he did it to all of Didn't like helicopters. <laughs> yeah. Had his toilet right in the middle of the street in a little shack and came out and was, yeah, it was great. A different side of Hawaii, yeah. everyone. Not, exactly. the, not the Aloha. Yeah, exactly. Not the Aloha spirit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so what else you got, Annie? Don't you have some other pictures? I could bring up, let me go to real quick. I got, oop, that's my other section. Yikes. No, come on. Uh, you can see Annie's schedule. Bruce is busting out a gallon's worth of coffee. Lucky Bruce. No, I, I, I need to um, hold off on the coffee, Bruce. Caffeine levels are at an all-time high right Not now. Not docs, is it? Oh, there it is. So, <laughs> oh god, here we go. But that's what the beer is for. Once we're done here, grab some beer, man. Depressants and stimulants, huh? <laughs> I don't know if I can ride that roller coaster. <laughs> 
and get yourself but home. But we can sell that Yeti. Yeah, we can sell that <laughs> Yeti thermos, though. I, I, we'll put the link for Amazon there. That's a cool thermos. Segway. So... <laughs> Sidebar, segue, whatever it is. So these images are what I call the signature flow. This was July 13th. Uh, 2008 and we heard in the morning that there was a, a what was it a um, a shield um, yeah it was a breakout from the shield that came down close to Royal Gardens and this this opened up it was they said it was an influx of lava in the system and the tube system at that point was very uh, solidly connected down to the ocean Bruce was down there shooting yeah, it I was on the say, ground Bruce this is was down the, at the literal, literal, literal explosions were going on and it broke out somehow something got, got, it didn't get clogged up, but there was so much lava that it couldn't mm -hmm. all go through the tube. And so it overflowed at the top of Royal Gardens and it went down and made these amazing flows. It was just a tremendous amount of lava. And it flowed, I would say, for about a mile and a half. There were um, several main arteries of it, uh, but she flowed all the way down and then right down here she went into a hole. And I mean, that was pouring into that hole. So I guess it was coming out of the tube and then going back into the tube. But the amount of lava was just outstanding. It was fantastic. We loved it. And so, we were able to shoot it from the air and from the ground. Yeah. Cal landed and let us out. Um, and uh, he took a tour and left us out there for about three hours. And it was so beautiful. I mean, uh, why it's called the signature flow is it just made me realize that every flow has a signature elements to it that are unique unto itself. And um, this was definitely a really, really remarkable um, flow. I mean, we even talked about maybe seeing if we could have Cal come back the next day. And we ended up finding out that 10 o'clock that night, it shut off. So we left about seven. And, um, and it, but it was right, actually, it was, it was almost paralleling one of the Very cool. uh, streets in Royal Gardens. So we actually could have, could have shot it and then walked out, walked down the street, walked out another one and been right at it again. It would have been really easy access. And it, in a way, I wish I'd done that, but it would have been hard, but it, it was doable. You know, it wasn't like you had to walk for miles and miles to get from one place to the next. And each place had its own little thing, you know. I called it a flash flow because it, it happened so quickly. Happened and then stopped. But man, it was a huge amount of lava. Awesome. Yeah, one of my favorites. That was really remarkable. Well, Those thank you. Shots, thank yeah. you, Andy, for being our guest and sharing your pictures with us and uh, sharing your story about all your wonderful artwork. Thank you. You are a true talent. And thank you for supporting me. And I love you very much. Aww. I really enjoyed it, Ann. That was thank great. Thank you. Yes, that was great. And thanks, guys. So you want to close it, Timmy, or what do you want to do? It's it's time to say mahalo. Mahalo. Do we so, have to say goodbye? It's time. It's time oh. to say goodbye. <laughs> you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. That's the bar, honey. <laughs> yep. It's um, <laughs> well, you could stay here and just replay the podcast again. Last if you want absolutely, you really absolutely, want to. <laughs> uh, over and Last over and call over again. For alcohol. Maybe you missed a bit, you know. And if you're listening to this on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts, don't forget you can see this on our YouTube channel. So just go to oht.rocks. That's our new domain. And you can watch this on YouTube. You can watch old episodes. And man, we rock. You can. Woo! Thanks, guys. <laughs> OHT oh, rocks. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. It's like this, and it's oh, like no. this. What's this? This is like Texas Longhorn. We're, like like, we're not the Longhorn. Slayer. We're the <laughs> Slayer. Ronnie oh Dio. Ronnie James Dio. You're too, you're too young. Rock you're on. too young. <laughs> cool. Hook them horns. All right. Okay, so, it's time to uh, go. All right. Thanks Bye. for joining us. Aloha. Aloha. Ah, aloha. <laughs> Is that good enough or are we supposed to do we'll, something special? We'll make that work somehow. <laughs> <laughs>